Hi, everyone. Um, our, our group is not large, and I'm thinking uh, that people are largely familiar with Stringfellow's life. Does it make, a, make sense to share a little bit about uh, his biography and who he was? Um, so yeah, just thumbnail here are some quick things. Uh, he was a Harvard trained lawyer who went from uh, graduating from law school straight to East Harlem in 1956 to do street law before there really was such a thing, be before the Legal Services Corporation or anything like that. And he, he went in connection with the East Harlem Protestant Parish, which was sort of the flagship of uh, urban ministry at the time. And, and within a couple of years, he had, uh, he'd left the ministry of the, the East Harlem Protestant Parish. Um, it was really there that he got introduced to the powers. Well, that's one way of thinking about it anyway. It was partly how the people of East Harlem talked about uh, the man or the welfare bureaucracy or uh, the mafia or the cops uh, as though they were predatory creatures arrayed against the, the community that really sent him uh, to the biblical texts. Um, theologically, uh, uh, well, academically, he was really on the edge of the academy theologically. Uh, when he was in law school, he had, he had taken some courses at Harvard Divinity School, uh, but his theological training really began when he was part of the student Christian movement. Um, he, he was often called a lay theologian, which was a kind of an academic put down, uh, though he also embraced that and thought that uh, Theologizing was, in fact, a uh, vocation of the of the laity. Um, uh, he, he was hugely influential, and we'll come to that in connection with the powers and bringing them back onto the map of theological ethics. But often not credited, not adequately footnoted. Uh, even Walter Wink, who you know. Uh, was really mentored by him and set on to his uh, work, his trilogy of the powers acknowledged how much he'd taken from Stringfellow without, without even realizing it, that he just so uh, internalized him. I mentioned student, the student Christian movement and uh, which he was involved in in college and then post-war in, the, in the immediate post-war period uh, when there was such a uh, sort of triumphalism in the ecumenical movement, uh, he was part of uh, a World Sweden Christian Conference in Oslo, Norway, uh, where actually folks were, uh, the folks who were speaking, uh, apart from someone like Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, but Martin Niemöller, Madame Barreau, Jacques Ellul um, were coming out of uh, resistance to Nazism and uh, were hardly triumphalist about it. Uh, and in fact, his experience there with other students, particularly um, uh, Pacific Islanders and Latin American students, uh, actually opened his eyes, uh, his, the reflection that he wrote, the report that he wrote for uh, SCM in the States was entitled, uh, What an American Does, <laughs> Why Does the World Hate America? <laughs> what an American Learned uh, Abroad. Um, so uh, in some ways he was really disabused, but also introduced to resistance and even to the power, theology of the powers in that, uh, in that experience. That, that would be the other roots of his um, earlier um, 
exposure to the powers. Um, and he recounts some of that in uh, at, toward the end of uh, uh, An Ethic for Christians. Um, he suffered illness, um, uh, actually in connection with the uh, World Student Christian Movement. He'd been to India and contracted hepatitis and ultimately that caught up with him uh, uh, in, in a complete uh, failure virtually of his pancreas. Um, and eventually uh, he went through experimental uh, surgery uh, and had it removed. Uh, well, I should say coming off of East Harlem, two things, two, two sort of personal things that are worth uh, mentioning, one related to the illness. Uh, he, was, he was very lonely in that period um, at, toward the end of East Harlem and, um, uh, and he was also drinking heavily. Um, he, his life had actually gotten somewhat dissolute. Um, he, uh, one time he was supposed to be speaking at, at a, at a banquet at Johns Hopkins University and the, and he was on the front page of the Baltimore Sun the next morning for not having showed where was the, this missing theologian and, uh, uh, anyway, it was, uh, he'd gotten drunk, um, and he often spoke drunk in those, in those days. Uh, but I think that, that in connection with his illness, there was, there was a point where he just quit. Um, uh, it wasn't a 12 step process. He, he said, I just couldn't tolerate the stuff anymore. And, uh, and he quit. That also coincides with a, this period of loneliness that I was alluding to. Um, and, you know, he had serial romantic relationships that, that uh, kind of came to a, a conclusion when he fell in love with Anthony Town. Um, Stringfellow was gay uh, and among uh, a whole circle of friends, uh, People just thought of him as out. And then there are other close friends who don't believe it. Um, so one of, one of, his, one of his friends uh, described him as almost not out. Um, and um, of course he grew up in the, in the 50s and early 60s in, 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 that, in, the experience, in that experience. Um, but he also, I don't, I don't think he embraced I, what we think of as identity politics these days. He really thought that was, uh, that who he loved was not about who he was essentially. Um, and, uh, and that his homosexuality was not part of his essence. Anyway, those are two personal things that, uh, I think both of which uh, uh, reflect his or uh, influence his uh, a certain number of choices that he made for the margin, uh, even like going to, to East Harlem. Whether that was a bad career move for a Harvard trained lawyer, and uh, but it, but in a way internally he'd grown up on more on the margin. Uh, than um, was probably visible. Um, the illness prompted, uh, well, there was a period living with Anthony uh, where they had an apartment on uh, 79th Street, actually, a, uh, what do you call it, a penthouse apartment, kind of a shaggy one, but it was a, it was a destination for ecclesial and theological visitors with many parties and fundraisers and uh, yeah, it was a very, very busy place, but it was also taking a toll on him along with the illness and uh, which is, was still then undiagnosed. 
Um, so he and Anthony moved to Block Island, an island off the coast of, of Rhode Island. Uh, I'm making this story longer than I intended, but um, so shut me off if, it's, if it seems to be going on too much. Uh, on the island, uh, he actually became involved in local politics, both in terms of fighting overdevelopment on the island, uh, uh, in terms of advocating for poor people on the island, which there were some, uh, there was a, an, an such folks in the year round uh, uh, population, and also uh, environmentally. Uh, he was actually had a sort of a legacy on, on Block Island. Um, he developed a friendship with uh, Daniel Berrigan that came out of their writing and particularly a, a book that Bill had written about his work in East Harlem. And um, Berrigan, who that's my head is actually much more full of Berrigan these days because I just did a book on, on him uh, though they're closely related and, and overlapping. Um, Berrigan, who uh, I met when he got out of uh, jail for, out of federal prison for burning draft files in, in 1968 and really initiating a, a whole series of hundreds of uh, draft board raids. Um, uh, was convicted of that uh, action with, with eight others. Uh, and rather than submitting to authority, he went underground for, for four months and was on the FBI's most wanted list. Um, and where they caught up with him was at uh, Stringfellow's house on Block Island. Uh, so he and Anthony um, were uh, charged with harboring a fugitive. And though those charges were eventually uh, quashed, um, it really was the first time, you know, he'd been advocating legally for, for poor folks uh, and poor and people of color, uh, poor to black and Puerto Rican folks in Harlem, East Harlem. Uh, but it was the first time that he'd actually been uh, uh, a victim or assaulted by uh, the law. And um, I believe not only that experience of, of being um, uh, targeted uh, by, by the federal government and probably surveilled closely before that, um, along with the conversations that he and he and Dan had while they were on the island theologically, which actually cons partly concerned the book of Revelation um, and, the, and the conversation about the principalities. Uh, between those two things, that's much behind uh, this book, An Ethic for Christians and Other Aliens in a Strange Land. Um, uh, yeah, in some ways, the personal emotional energy that's, that's under it stems directly from that uh, experience, I think, of being uh, charged. Um, he wrote an autobiographical trilogy, uh, An Ethic for Christians and Other Aliens in a Strange Land, um, What's the second one? Uh, oh, the second birthday is the account of his illness. Um, and then lastly, Simplicity of Faith, which is about both about life on the island with Anthony, uh, but particularly prompted by uh, Anthony's death. Uh, and it's subtitled his, My Experience in Mourning. Um, and he also uh, envisioned uh, an ethic for Christians and other aliens in a strange land being the first of an ethical trilogy. Um, the, the second volume of that is Conscience and Obedience, which followed a few years after and is uh, focused on uh, setting uh, Romans 13 and Revelation 13 side by side. 
uh, in the context of the American, uh, the U.S. bicentennial. Uh, and the third volume uh, he was intending uh, was uh, on the charismatic and the demonic. Um, and he has notes for that. Uh, I published some of those. I published the notes for it in, in that um, Keeper of the Word anthology. Uh, but I also think it's fair to, to count uh, his last book, uh, The Politics of Spirituality, as kind of completing that um, trilogy. Um, at the beginning of uh, an ethic, he says that the task is to read America biblically, not the opposite, uh, to put it awkwardly, he says, not to read uh, the Bible Americanly. Um, and in that, in a very simple, straightforward way, he's saying that uh, uh, the principalities and powers, which he's going to take on in the book, are not simply, including empire, are, simply, are not simply a matter of hermeneutics, but her, hermeneutics are a matter of the principalities, that they come for the book aggressively uh, uh, seeking to uh, claim it uh, in their own vested interest. And uh, the first example of that, which he turns to, he, he roots that issue and that problem in the fourth century, the Constantinian conversion of the church and the the necessity at that point for uh, sort of depoliticizing uh, the New Testament and particularly the language of the powers, rendering them uh, kind of spiritual, in spiritual outer space and not really applying to uh, the emperor or the hierarchical institutions of, uh, of power. And it really took uh, uh, historical crises. I mean, there are various points in in uh, history of biblical interpretation where they do light up and come back uh, uh, onto the map for you know at various points. Uh, but the mo this most recent uh, awakening uh, was prompted on the one hand by the rise of Nazism and fascism in, in Europe. And in this country uh, focused, um, the, the rereading of the powers was uh, kind of reclaimed by um, racial, through racial crisis and through the, the war in uh, US war in Southeast Asia. Um, and suddenly the uh, those terms again sort of lit up um, and Stringfellow is one of the key people in in bringing the powers back onto the map of, uh, of social ethics uh, I think it's I think it's also interesting that in the same period uh, Martin Luther King is writing about the giant triplets of um, racism, militarism, and extreme materialism. He's he's naming the the principalities, the reigning principalities uh, in the U.S. And uh, I think it's it's also fair to pass that awakening through through his speech at uh, at, at Riverside Church. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up. I'm just gonna name uh, several things which. Uh, for which I think, which make this an important book. Um, uh, one is, is the way in which it does uh, reintroduce the, the powers. He had, he had done that, his, his own writing about the powers first uh, happened in 64 with free and obedience. Uh, he has a chapter on them there, but this is really the the full development of his theology of the powers, and and uh, and in some in that sense, it's theologically 
perhaps his most influential book, even if unfootnoted. Um, it was kind of a theological handbook for the resistance movement in this country um, in the in the seventies and eighties, and uh, and for example, you know, Dan and Phil Berrigan uh, sort of launched another wave of liturgical uh, sabotage in the in the plowshares movement, uh, and I think this book is under that. Uh, movement as well. Uh, it's uh, important in terms of fusing a reading of Paul's language of the powers with uh, uh, Apocalypse of, of St. John and particularly what Bill calls the Babylon uh, parallels, um, parables. It's the first in that ethics trilogy. Um, and it's seated by the federal charges that I already mentioned. I think those are, uh, yeah, you know, the one other conversation which would be worth talking about, but I'll maybe I'll pause for the moment would be with Jacques Alou, but uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I would say, Bill, that, uh, Stringfellow is pretty underground. I, I think, I, I don't think, you know, without your personal recommendation of him to me 25 years ago, and it took me 25 years to go from a, a personal recommendation to actually really digging into Stringfellow and now seeing why you wanted to edit at least two anthologies and why he keeps coming up in your personal story. And in that beautiful introduction, thank you for that. You left out a lot of his own ways in which maybe he's me he's mentored you. and And I feel like, you know, in your relationship with your your daughters and and the G's uh, collective up there in um, in Detroit, and some of the um, other projects that are coming out of uh, the ongoing Detroit Catholic worker scene, you know that you're you know mentoring you know a new generation, young much younger than me, of activists for whom this material then you know is going to become you know fresh and new. But I think there's we run the risk if we don't read these books and talk about these books, I think we really run, run the risk of, of, of losing, uh, losing this material. I think we, we, the possibility is, is out there um, that, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to stay with this material, but this material is going to, going to kind of vanish from our um, radars. And in addition to the thing you said about the, you know, the Bible um, being read Americanly, um, I think one of the other things, too, that I loved about the, the preface is that he says this is a polemic. He's, he, he, he sort of discards any niceties about this book, you know, being it's not it's not a devotional. It's not a um, exegetical text, even though it does do some of that with uh, with the story of Babylon. Um, but he really says this is a polemic. And, and, he, and he says what he's pointing out. I love the ferocity of his language, but he says he's pointing out uh, what he calls the habitual malpractice of the way that we read the Bible as politics. And he, he says two things in the preface that are just so stunning. One, that you have the same person. He says it's the same person will say, well, you can't put you know, the Bible in, in politics. Don't mix the Bible in politics. And, I, and I'm, I'm wounded, uh, uh, Corey Simon, uh, Rick, Rick Quinn, because I've come, I'm coming off of a season where I heard that a lot. Well, you can't, Andrew, don't mix the Bible and politics. So don't do that. And he says it with great specifics how obviously a, of a political text it is. But he says the same person who says, well, don't mix politics and religion, Smith, um, Kellerman. Uh, he, he also says that these are the same people who will tell you that the story of America is the story of Israel. I mean, they'll, they'll do this kind of, you know, this is the New Jerusalem riff, uh, which takes great leaps in terms of rewriting the story of America, much less, you know, conflating and kind of projecting um, onto us. And I honestly, and I've read, um, I've dabbled in, you know, in Elul, uh, especially the Anarchy and Christianity book, uh, which uh, interestingly enough, Bill, um, uh, Ken gave me the Elul Anarchy and Christianity book when I started hanging out with uh, the Fifth Estate people in Detroit. <laughs> I, I, for those of you <laughs> Catching up here, I left Bill's tutelage around after about a year under under Bill's 
tutelage. She would get tutored by a bunch of uh, of wild uh, atheist uh, uh, anarchist uh, activists in Detroit. Um, but they actually have a lot in common. Um, Bill even used to write for the uh, for the Fifth Estate. But I don't think I've uh, you're other than like you and Barrigan and the Barrigans and, and Dorothy Day. I've I've rarely read a, a Christian author who speaks about empire and America as, as a Babylon with this level, you know, of, of ferocity. And I, I feel like that's what we, we needed. And when Corey and I picked the day and the time of this, we were thinking of the day and time that would fit his schedule and my schedule to host this for you all. And we're going to do six sessions. This is one of six. We're going to do three in, in, in June and three in July. Um, I didn't know that June 1st, I wasn't thinking June 1st. This is a, a, a really terrifying anniversary today. This is the day a year ago that Trump went out of his barricade and across through uh, the protesters, gasped the protesters to hold the Bible upside down backwards in front of, uh, of an Anglican uh, uh, Episcopal church and then, to, and, and then to walk back. Um, and, and then he gave a speech that day that I think historians might uh, consider to be his declaration of war against the American people, because we, we saw with, you know, General Flynn over the weekend, um, you know, the calls for a military coup uh, in the in the United States. So I think the reason why I wanted to get some friends together to read this book and, and why I want to keep thinking about this book is because I do think it needs to be, like you said, a revolution, uh, I'm sorry, a manual for the re resistance uh, uh, for theological uh, thinking and minded folks. But this idea that America is a Babylon and, and that a Babylon will always fall, um, and that this is a, a, a symbol of rejoice, or this is an occasion for rejoicing, um, was something that struck me as so counterintuitive um, to sort of, you know, um, you know, duct all the duct tape we keep pasting on the, you know, we we, we keep, you know, we, we we go to the to the store and buy the best red, white, and blue duct tape we can find, and we keep patching the holes. You know, in, in this leaking ship, as as we're rearranging the, the deck chairs as well. So, um, uh, thank you, Bill, for that introduction. And we've got a lot of other great people on the call. Um, uh, so, um, I don't know if uh, uh, Corey or um, uh, or, or Barb or Rick hey would like to chime. I have to get going, and and and, but I will be here next week and be able to stay the whole time. So, thanks again, guys. Um, I'm Ethan. Pleasure to meet you all. <laughs> See you next week, Ethan. Thanks for getting on the call. See you call. next week. Of course. So um, when y'all are not talking, I'm muting you. And so, um, Bill, there's a little button at the bottom of your screen to unmute yourself if you want to talk. But I want to see if Corey or Barb or Rick would like to chime in. And, Rick, you, you have to hit star six on your phone if you want to chime in. Um, but I would love this to be a, a, a round robin. And a, a, I think last summer I, ma I made Bill do this, and I just basically interviewed him. But let's, let's see what else uh, – is coming up for y'all. Uh, Corey, would you like to say something? Sure. <clears throat> um, I was introduced to Stringfellow actually by Ethan, <laughs> uh, which is part of the reason why I decided to invite him to this. Um, I, I kind of stumbled across him my last semester of seminary, I was writing a, uh, a exegesis paper on Romans. And at the time I was developing like this, uh, I was developing this idea of like the 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 inverted trinity is kind of how I referred to it at the time of how Paul speaks of sin and death and uh, I think evil or one of the two and and talking about how those three kind of coexist and co-mingle within the book of Romans especially um, and then I was turned on to uh, Stringfellow I was turned on to conscience and obedience um which i read that and i was like oh this actually articulates everything i was trying to say better um and that kind of changed the whole uh that that changed the whole way i think about it and talk about it um uh, but it was just one of those things where it was interesting where i was on i was kind of coming to the same conclusions by based on my own reading um and since then i of course you know became hyper fixated on Stringfellow and purchased all of his books online. In some cases, I ended up purchasing two copies because as it turns out, when you order used copies of obscure works on Amazon, there's a good chance you're going to get signed copies. <laughs> and so 
I, uh, I ended up with two signed copies of uh, a couple of his books, and I, of course, had to tuck those away in my curio cabinet um, and reorder those, <laughs> reorder new copies of each of those books, which was very funny. Um, but, uh, no, uh, this, this book actually happens to be my, my favorite of his books. Um, it's definitely the one that I've read the most. Uh, I constantly go back to, oh, it's either chapter two or three when he talks about the, uh, the, when he comes up with the, the idea of Babel. Um, and I, I talk about that. I, I talk about that all the time. Um, so I'm excited, especially for that chapter. Hey, uh, Barb or uh, Rick, would either of you all like to hop into the conversation? Am I unmuted? Yeah, you, you're good. Okay. I am not a student of Stringfellow, and I'm mostly here to listen, but this is conversations reminding me of a story I will tell. It was 1962, I believe, and Carl Bart was at the, I think, the Divinity School of the University of Chicago, and the student intern at the college I was attending invite, wanted to go and invited students to go, and he'd drive us to Chicago, and we'd get to hear Carl Bart. And the panel included Stringfellow, and of course, I'm here totally learning. I mean, I probably knew nothing about any of this. Oh, but I had to go because my fiance was in Chicago. So there was kind of a sidebar issue. And he was actually attending Chicago Theological Seminary. So probably they were all assigned to attend this event. And we went together. And what do I remember about it? Who knows? But I do remember Carl Bart pointing at Stringfellow and going, listen to this man. So anyway, that's my Stringfellow story. And being the introvert I am, did either of us try to speak with any of these people afterwards? Absolutely not. And I have no idea how many people were in attendance, but plenty, I can tell you. So that's my Stringfell story, and I'm really here to learn, and it's not that I've never read anything, but clearly I am in no way a um, Stringfellow student, and now I'm wondering, should I be promoting this study in my current community and see if I recruit you some? Um, I mean, I think what you're saying, Andrew, about um, this work needs... Um, promoting or whatever. So uh, I can certainly send an email and if I hit some of the right people, maybe somebody will tune in next week. We'll see. I invited some of the people from our Sunday morning class and uh, one of them asked me, what book group is it? And I said, it's a pop-up <laughs> book group for this book. You know, um, I just really wanted to, to look at this book again. Um, it kind of saved me really last summer. It saved my faith. Uh, this text, which is why it's not a depressing text to me at all, because I was so furious last summer um, at some of the theological, uh, to use the Stringfellow word, naivete um, around the rebellion that was happening across America last summer, um, that um, I was experiencing uh, theological naivete in, in, my, in, in my readings on, most, on, on social media. And uh, I this book is, says that we're all naive about the powers because not only and Bill Bill Kellerman maybe you can jump back in now. Not only are the powers real, but the powers have a personality, and that these institutions. You you began talking you know about Harlem and people talking about the man. Well, there is a proverbial, and it is a man. It is patri patriarchal uh, to the core. Uh, maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Um, and I know you're, you're hoping to join us again next week too, but Bill, would you talk a little bit more about this idea that the, um, the institutions of America have a personality and have a, because you know, remember when uh, a couple of years ago, uh, people started talking a lot about how bizarre it is that uh, corporations have all these rights, you know, that a corporation 
is considered to be a person legally. But that seems to fit right into this problem of the of the principalities, maybe. Bill, I'm wondering if you'd want to hop back on that thread if you're still if you're still with us, if we didn't lose you. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> Stringfellow, Stringfellow took the uh, Supreme Court ruling on the 13th Amendment that said corporations were were persons. Uh, he would mention that occasionally in support of the notion that they had uh, separate identity and personhood. Uh, obviously, that legal ruling is hugely uh, problematic, uh, especially as it gives them uh, legal standing in equivalent with individual human beings. <laughs> um, uh, but the notion that uh, institutions or uh, nations or corporations uh, have a, a distinct uh, personality, um, Stringfellow and Wink who followed him would say, uh, they each have a, a particular vocation, uh, uh, unique uh, to uh, it, both as a way of uh, praising God and serving human life. Uh, but just as uh, human beings are, are fallen uh, and The same thing happens to institutions and uh, uh, corporations. Uh, their best intention, their calling, uh, is is lost in the fall, is distorted, uh, is twisted, and Stringfellow would say has virtually become uh, demonic, which he thought was synonymous with the. Uh, uh, that was his way of speaking about the fall, and I think accurately so. Um, um, that also means, I think for both of them, Stringfellow and Wink again, that, uh, that such institutions not only stand before the judgment of God in the same way that the nations do in prophetic literature, uh, but uh, that they can be called by human beings back to their created uh, and intended uh, vocations. So for some, for, uh, on the one hand, discerning the vocation of, of the powers is a, uh, is a political act that uh, human beings are authorized, he would say, to do, uh, and then to call them to that uh, created vocation at the same time uh, as a, as a rebuke and and virtually often is not through resistance uh, to them um, so anyway I and it also gets at certainly the the spiritual dimension what Walter Wink called the interiority of, of the institutions but that that uh, personality and character uh, is expressed externally, but also its its power over human beings often is not as is uh, much more expressed by its invisible character. I don't know if that's what you were wanting me to get at, but well, this idea that the powers can be redeemed is such a helpful idea, but it seems that we end up banging our heads against the wall so often. I mean, I'm thinking about your work you know, trying to redeem Detroit, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I just, you know, my brief foray in uh, to try to really belong to the institutional church to, to do the work kind of, you know, within the principality of church, it, I, I found it so frustrating and it can be so frustrating when we stand inside these institutions trying to redeem them. And I think there, I think there's this I think that one of the naivetes that Stringfellow is talking about is that we think they're inherently redemptive. There's this quote he says on, um, 
on page uh, 18 of my preface. He says, yet to be ignorant or gullible or ingenuous about the demons, to underestimate the inherent capacities of the principalities, to fail to notice the autonomy of these powers as creatures, abets their usurpation of human life and their domination of human beings. And then a couple pages later, he says um, this, and it's a long section, but I, I want to get into the text a little bit as we're wrapping up our first session. He says, racial conflict, this is on page 20, racial conflict has been suppressed by an elaborate apartheid. Products which supposedly mean abundance or convenience turn out to contaminate or jeopardize life. The environment itself is rendered hostile. There is pervasive babble. Corey Simon, there's your babble. There's pervasive babble. I mean, what is Twitter? I think, uh, Bill, in your essay about Trump, at the end of one of your recent books, you talk a lot about the babble of, of the Trump period. Uh, privacy is a memory because surveillance is ubiquitous. Institutional coercion of human beings has proliferated relentlessly. Whatever must be said of earlier times, in the past quarter century, America has become a technological totalitarianism in which hope in its ordinary human connotations is being annihilated. And this was 1973, folks. And so I'm like, okay, come on now. Come on, people. Because I, I, I think reading this uh, uh, under, under Nixon, and only you and, and, and Barb on the call really remember what it was like, you know, un, under the Nixon years. Um, I, I do remember that Ken and Barb, Bill, uh, pumped me full of caffeine. I think I was about nine or something. The, the night of the resignation, they wanted me to stay up late to watch <laughs> the resignation. And I remember walking down our little street in, a, in, in Cleveland, uh, and, and mom knew every house, if they were Republicans or not. She would, she would point out the houses of the Republicans on our street. I was like, I don't know, six years old. She's like, they're Republicans. They're Re <laughs> pretty much my whole street here in Cookville Bar, I'm pretty sure. So today... I can't leave. I, I did leave the house today, but I can't leave the house to, so, without today. I think I saw one Trump flag, one Trump sign, one Confederate flag, you know, to, 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 to just leave the house where, where we and Barb is my neighbor now. You know, she lives at Uplands to leave the house around here. You see um, the principality of, 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 of Trumpism in, in full in its full splendor, um, the the rise of ne neo Confederacy, neo fascism, uh, white supremacy, um, you know the the, the erasure of, of CRT, and, and this is this whole critical race theory thing is just so bonkers to me. But this kind of the, the, the institutional, the principality of Tennessee made it against the law to tell children the truth about slavery because they believe it is child abuse for white children. To learn about slavery. Can I jump in here, Andrew? Am, am I unmuted? When I was giving him this house by house tour about Republicans, I want you to know no one had a sign out front announcing their uh, loyalty or whatever. <laughs> Well, he talks about uh, Bill. He talks about paying patronage. I mean, he says he, he says um, he thinks that these principalities. Are, he's saying that we naively think that these principalities are subject to our sponsorship, patronage, and control. And I think what I think what the the magas are are upset about in part is they thought it worked. You know, they thought they had they had control of the empire. You know, and and we're naive to think that just because it's Biden Harris, that it's not still it's not still the empire. Um, and and it's interesting, too, because I think some of the I don't know if you guys you noticed this bill last uh, spring, uh, spring a year ago when they had all those protests um, around where you live and they made national news. Uh, the tweet that the former president made was liberate Michigan. But the, all those liberate. I, I know some people from my old circles, from the olden days in, in my old times in Detroit, who have kind of switched sides and who were a part of all of these kind of li libertarian commerce, you know, uh, protests. I think they've I think they've appropriated and absconded with some of our rhetoric <laughs> um, uh, of the historical kind of re rebellion uh, community, the communities of rebellion. They've, they've, they've sort of, a, they've sort of, 
made off with some of our, our rhetoric. Um, Corey, you want to chime in on anything else? And, and Rick, I don't know if you're, you're driving home from the airport or not, but I, I did want to acknowledge my buddy Rick is on the call. Um, Bill, I've showed you ordinary space. Um, hopefully Rick will be able to be on his computer and with a, a camera next week. He's getting home from a, a family vacation today, but uh, um, uh, he helps edit ordinary space, which you have, which we egregiously put a typo in your beautiful poem about the pandemic about a year ago this time. Um, we've got about five more minutes. Who would like to uh, help us wrap up our first uh, Stringfellow group? If uh, if Corey or uh, Rick don't hop in, I'm gonna beg Bill to take us home. Oh, there was Corey, a Corey. Come on, Corey, go ahead. Yeah, there there was just a there was just a passage that I had. Uh... Uh, plan to pull up, but for the life of me now, I can't find it. Um, <laughs> it was a passage talking about uh, how they're kind of on the precipice. We're kind of on the precipice of of everything falling apart and getting worse. Um, and, you know, again, thinking back to how this was written in the 70s, this was written almost a full 50 years ago. Um, and seeing how how much of this like how much of it remains relevant um and how much of it like has come to pass <laughs> uh and right now we're kind of just watching um we're watching all of this like uh intensify worse than I think Stringfellow would have imagined it being. Um, I, I sometimes I sometimes joke uh, when I talk to people about Stringfellow about how he would, I could only imagine him screaming in books if he were writing them now um, and just uh, entire chapters in caps lock. I couldn't agree more and this Corey, I, I agree so much. And this book is so it's so it's so desperate as it is. I mean, the book is very much a um, you know, a red flag. Uh, you know, it's a uh, it's a clarion call, it's a a blaring, you know, a blaring marching, you know, it's a it's an it's a little ragtag marching band of activists, you know, taking over the uh, you know, the streets of Detroit. Uh, Bill, did you hear about this mysterious uh, uh, airplane flight last summer that um, Trump and the Detroit police chief and William Barr all flew over Detroit? When uh, they were, when they were, about that. Trump, not Trump himself, but William Barr uh, and Chief Craig, who's, uh, as, as you may know, has just stepped down. Uh, uh, <laughs> He's claiming great, you know, credit for uh, uh, a really successful run. He was appointed by an, by the emergency manager, by a non-elected official in the, in the beginning, um, and had uh, overseen really the uh, a, a pol police policy of very aggressive uh, policing and virtually an occupation of of uh, the black community again is is been nationally a spokes spokesperson for uh, uh, gun proliferation. He's he's argued that teachers should be armed. Uh, he was on the cover of the NRA uh, magazine and has really functioned as a, as I say as a national. Uh, spokesperson for aggressive policing in the last year uh, during the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter here in Detroit called uh, Detroit, a group called Detroit Will Breathe. Uh, at a at a certain point, the, the curfew really ended up being a very aggressive assault on 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 them. And in that same period, uh, Police violence, particularly with broken bones, hospitalizations, and killings, uh, has increased last year by 41% under his um, administration. And much of that 
uh, targeted at the uh, Detroit Will Be Breathe demonstrators. Uh, yeah, they they filed a a suit, uh, a lawsuit against the police chief and the department, and uh, are now under the department's now under a police order not to to use uh, rubber bullets and tear gas and I mean that this whole list of things that were in the order apart from uh, probable cause. And the chief turned around and sued, <laughs> uh, sued Detroit Will Breathe. Uh, and the Detroit City Council funded it to the tune of $200,000, $200, with which they made a very slick uh, 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 video, you know, basically blaming Detroit Will Breathe for the in uh, the increase in uh, police brutality in the last year. So yes, he's totally, uh, uh, and he's thrown in now with the, the openly with the, the Republicans and plans to run for governor against uh, Whitner. Uh, so the folks who have, you know, attempted to disempower Detroit voters uh, in the election uh, and are doing so now at the, at the state law and policy level. Uh, that's who he's running with. So yeah, that plane that plane trip was not uh, accidental or yeah. Uh, so and, and and I guess it points to my I was responding to Corey's comment about screaming in all caps. So you have this you know these rebellions that swept the United States in the late sixties. And you have, uh, you know, these attempts at reform, you know, uh, a generation ago when you were, you know, you know, in your in your 20s and I was just a little kid and 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 Corey saying, well, now what would Stringfellow do now? I mean, he would be he would just be screaming, you know, at this at this reality that we're living in now. So last summer we have this, you know, global uprising against police brutality, but especially a national uprising here in the United States where all with a few exceptions, the response, the state's response was to do more police brutality to these largely peaceful uprisings that, that swept the nation. And it was, it became, you know, uh, this, you know, kind of totalitarianism uh, that we haven't, that we haven't seen. And, and, and I think they thought, I think they thought that they were going to, they were going to win uh, this um, statement by, um, General Flynn over the weekend, you know, about, you know, well, we should have a coup here, just like they had in um, Myanmar. I can't say the name properly. Uh, I think they thought, you know, that all the police and all the military would just immediately, you know, fall under the, the sway of the former um, of the former uh, um, uh, executive. Um, and uh, and then that, that and, it, and it didn't. Um, uh, I, I just uh, saw somebody hop on, and I'm not sure if he's still there. I think he's an hour late. I will have to remind him. Uh, Dick, you're an hour late. Uh, we're just wrapping up our first meeting, and I'm so excited for you to meet Bill Kellerman. So I'm going to stop recording, and I want – Bill, don't leave yet. I want you to meet my, 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 my friend Dick Neal because, Dick, I've been bragging – uh, to Dick about you, but I'm going to stop the re the recording part. I want you to, guys to meet each other uh, desperately, and then and then uh, the time zone uh, uh, will situation will get uh, will get fixed.